Today is December 3rd, 2003. My name is Sarah Everhard, interviewing William Ford uh, regarding his experiences in World War II and Korea. Okay. All right. What, we, what I'd like to start, um, <clears throat> start off with is get a little background about just prior to you going into the service. Were you in school or were you working or... Um, were you drafted? What was the, what all, were the circumstances? All of the above. All okay. of the above. Uh, when, when the um, war came along, uh, I, was in, I was in my senior year in high school. And when uh, I can remember uh, the Sunday, uh, December the 7th, I had come back from, we had come home from church and I lived in a little garage apartment uh, behind the house that had been servants' quarters at one time. And uh, I had been listening to the radio. Listen, I remember I was listening to one man's family. And they interrupted the show and uh, declared that somebody had dropped a bomb on Pearl Harbor. And uh, I went in and told my mother and father, uh, because they were uh, busy in home <laughs> home duties, and so we all white listened to the uh, radio for the rest of the afternoon uh, to find out what was going on. Um, that was uh, I had uh, actually I had uh, graduated the year before that. I graduated in 1941 in spring, and I had worked at Sears Roebuck. Uh, to earn enough money so I could go to uh, school out in California. Well, I went on out in January at uh, 42, went out to California and finished up a year's course in aeronautical engineering. Came back to Atlanta in time to go to work for Bell Aircraft, who was moving in to uh, activate the, the, the bummer plant because everybody in Marietta pronounces it the bummer plant. But we, uh, uh, I worked with uh, Bill down at, uh, on Marietta Street before they, I came in as they were unloading and we were doing uh, templates to uh, build the B-29. And uh, as I, uh, three months later, I got the call from uh, Uncle Sam and my draft board had been in California, and my draft board was not interested in Bell Aircraft's manpower needs, so uh, they had not uh, given me any kind of deferment. And uh, so I went out to Fort Mac, was sworn in, came back to uh, Bell, and worked that last week before I went, went off to uh, uh, Miami Beach, Florida. Uh, this was known uh, to uh, the recruits as the land of prickly heat and ringworm because the beaches down there, I, I don't know where they came from, but uh, particularly the south beaches of Miami were just full of ringworm and you prickly heat, of course. But uh, spent uh, two, three months in basic training down there, um, went was classified as a uh, uh, weather technician and was sent to Rantoul, Illinois to Chanute Field where I underwent, underwent a three-month training period as a weather observer. While I was there, a couple of us got to talking about being uh, what our options were and what our likelihood was of service. and. Um, most of the weather assignments were in places like, wonderful places like Greenland, uh, the um, islands off of Alaska and, and things like that. And we decided that the, um, uh, the Air Force Cadet Program had opened an office on uh, Chanute for a drive of getting new members or new cadets. And uh, we, a couple of us decided we'd go down and, and try our luck. And, and uh, we had no problems passing the uh, 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 
exam, had a little problem with blood pressure because we were excited, had a little problem with blood pressure getting in as far as passing the physical. And we were then assigned, uh, after being accepted as cadets, we were then assigned to go back to Miami Beach. This time, uh, the first time we had been on the South Beach, when we went back as cadets, uh, we were on the North Beach, which was about 25, 30 miles north of where we stood off. And uh, our billeting was in old um, uh, motel accommodations around the golf courses around northern, uh, the northern uh, part of Miami Beach. And we spent another couple of months there and uh, came November, as it, was, it seemed to always happen in the, in the service, at least for me, uh, around November, October, um, when things started cooling down up north, uh, and when being in Florida would not have been so bad, they decided I needed to go to St. Uh, above St. Uh, Paul, Minneapolis area uh, to um, hmm, a little town called Collegeville, and the uh, this was a College de tra uh, CTD, College Training Detachment for uh, cadets. Uh, they they like to have some college education with a cadet, and we went to college, uh, CTD up there. This was a combination a Catholic uh, university, and it had a um, a monastery and a convent in conjunction there. The uh, brothers did the teaching, the brothers did the farming, they tended, I mean they, they had a total farm there, uh, uh, growing wheat and vegetables, the whole smear, and also a good dairy herd. Uh, the sisters did all of the cooking and the, as, as the time was then, the uh, uh, division of labor. The, they did the feminine part, the brothers did the masculine part. And we always, at uh, that school, we waited for mealtime because the sisters baked the most wonderful cracked wheat bread and it came right out of the oven before it was put on the table and sliced with butter churned from the dairy herd. We had no problems with uh, the ration stamps. Just a wonderful place up there. Well, we had uh, three months up there. We got a little bit of flight training, and I decided at that time, after a couple of uh, scares or miscues and, and flying, I decided that I didn't need to be a pilot, that I could be a navigator. And uh, that's what I pursued. We were sent from there to Santa Ana for uh, what they call it, classification, classification and pre-flight uh, training. And um, we uh, Spent, I think it was about three months down at uh, Santa Ana. We had a delay. They did not have enough uh, capacity, training capacity to train all of us, and we had a delay and did a little extra drilling down at uh, Santa Ana before we went to uh, gunnery school in Kingman, Arizona. And the 50 caliber, uh, learning to fire the 50 caliber and how to handle it, and actually going up and doing flight training with in gunnery positions. And seeing that I was, uh, at the time, about six foot four, maximum that you could be and get in the Air Force, um, the position on the B-17 that they trained me in, or put me in for training, was the ball turret gun on the B-17. I don't know whether you've ever seen that, but that is a, 
It's about a three foot diameter ball with two machine guns running out and you had to get in, put your knees up around your ears and your tush down on the seat and tuck in and then latch yourself into this ball. And when you were there, you were not uncomfortable, but, <laughs> but you were tight. Mm -hmm. And you had two little controls up about your head, they were kind of like bicycle handles, and you controlled by twisting, you controlled the movement of the ball turret. Being six foot four, I could not get into the ball turret except by having all of the glass panels taken out of the ball turret so that I could stick my feet through, get in and sit down, and then pull my knees up around my ears and my feet in the stirrups, which was, but I couldn't fly because they couldn't do that. But I did on the, on the uh, simulator, I did, did that training. We finished up um, gunnery in about uh, two and a half months. Um, and then we're sent to uh, various uh, navigation schools around the area. This was a group of navigators and bombardiers. And we were sent to the different schools. I went to um, Selman Field in Monroe, Louisiana. And I've gotten, now I've gotten tropical in Miami. I've gotten Arctic in Minnesota. I've got desert in California and Arizona, and now they put me in the bayou country down in Louisiana. And it did give us a it did give us a variety of um, of the country available. Uh, in I think it was 16 weeks, we graduated from um, navigation school and were given two weeks off and sent to um, Lincoln, Nebraska. And I really didn't know at the time that it was going to be that much influence on me, but um, later when I uh, had come out of service and had come back to the real world after the war, I met a, a, a young lady from Atlantic, Iowa, who had been in school at Lincoln, Nebraska, at Lincoln, uh, Nebraska University, University of Nebraska, at the time I had gone through the training. But we had, uh, we did get assigned at that point. We got assigned our uh, uh, crews, and we went to our various ways, and. Um, we kind of broke up some beginning friendships, some of, some of which lasted quite a while. But um, went to, I went to Biggs Field, uh, El Paso, Texas, and was back in the desert again. And uh, this was in November and December, right after I, I, we, we graduated navigation in, in uh, November of 44. And, um, we uh, uh, went through uh, all of the uh, combat crew training, and uh, I, I got my navigation missions in. We flew all over West Texas and into New Mexico and the borders of California, and um, we had uh, uh, training squadrons of fighters that would uh, pull attacks on our formations as we went about our training in the bomb in the B-17s, and these 17s were um, all uh, so-called war weary. They had been in use and principally coming apart. There was a le there was a legend about uh, B-17s that, uh, particularly the older ones, is that there was a cotter key in a beam, in a wing beam, in the bomb bay that you didn't want to touch because if you pull that cotter key out, the wings would fall off. So, I mean, <laughs> just, 
And and always the new crew in a in a combat unit always got the old aircraft, and they were always aware of that problem. But uh, we finished up our training in uh, Biggs Field, and uh, our crew came through very very nicely. Um, my name W William W. It is. Uh, um, one of one of my schoolmates uh, called, was from uh, um, Puerto Rico, but he was he very Spanish in his speaking, and he used to refer to me as wobbly wobbly. Yeah. But in the uh, in in our um, training in Biggs, uh, the graduation flight was flown with an air inspector, usually a captain or a major. <coughs> we had an air inspector that uh, was general, and then an instructor pilot that flew with the uh, flight deck. When we took our, when we took our training, or when we took our time with the graduation flight, we went through all the motions. The crew had a, uh, an enlisted men of the crew uh, were loose. They they were not real. They were civilian soldiers, and uh, they referred to their officers uh, in in more familiar terms than the average uh, uh, academy graduate would. And we came back for a debriefing, and the captain that had uh, had flown with us as an air inspector debriefed us said that we were doing fine. Our crew was among the best that he had seen. But <coughs> the um, crew should ref, uh, defer from calling um, the officers by familiar names, nicknames. And the crew, um, excuse me, the crew had taken a nickname from me the WW as Lu Lu <coughs> excuse me, Wee Wee, um, and, the, and the captain, <coughs> the captain told us uh, that we should not do that, that they should have a little bit more. Hmm, excuse me, I've got a. Oh, <coughs> yes, a please. <coughs> Well, we, we uh, they, uh, as I said, the, um, the, the captain said that the, the crew should refrain from uh, being familiar with the, uh, particularly with the officers of the crew, and they said, show a little more respect, and said, so address them by their rank. Well, the crew decided that my rank, or my name, was Lieutenant Wee Wee. We had a good we had a good group. We had a, a, a fellow from uh, Ball Turret was from uh, Brooklyn. The uh, tail gunner who I'm trying to find now uh, was from Long Island, and uh, his father was a, a mortician. And he went back when he came back. He was he took over the business. Um, our uh, engineer was the old man of the crew, and he was 26. And he was uh, an auto mechanic from uh, uh, Texarkana, Arkansas. And uh, our co-pilot, our pilot was from Columbus, Ohio. Our co-pilot was uh, the second oldest of the crew. Uh, he was from uh, near Galesburg, Illinois. Of course, I was from Georgia. <coughs> uh, I was the number four of, of ten people. I was number four in age. Our pilot was the second youngest member of the crew, the, the, the boss. Our armor gunner was uh, the third oldest of the crew, and he was a Mormon from Cedar City, Utah. 
and, and, and a real nice guy, a real, real nice guy. And uh, we had two waste gunners, one from, one from Indiana and one from uh, Ohio. And the radio man, the radio man, I never didn't, I don't remember where he was from. It was a fellow named Jones, of course, Jonesy. Um, and he stayed in, he stayed in the service. The only crew member that I know of that stayed in the service after the um, uh, unpleasantness was over. So when we uh, we we were assigned, went back to Lincoln. We were assigned uh, an aircraft. Um, it took two or three days uh, to check the thing out, take it up, um, take it up for a check flight, and check out all of the systems, make sure that we had everything working right. And then, about three days after we had assigned the airplane and gotten the testing done, we loaded it. We took off at uh, around 11, 11 o'clock at night, headed for um, Goose Bay, uh, Labrador. And uh, we flew up there, got in, landed, taxied over to the um, uh, parking area. And when we got out of the airplane, we looked up at the top of the snow banks around the taxi, the parking area, that uh, there was, there was uh, 10, 12 feet of snow. Well, they had uh, they had just dug out two days before, apparently, and we were sent into the uh, mess hall and the barracks, and we got in. We had our supper. We um, went to the barracks and stretched out and. I, we were gone. We none, none of us took off our uniforms or anything. We just were sacked out. We hadn't been asleep more than about an hour and a half, and they came and they said, there's a frontal system coming in. We've got to get you out of here. So we took off, and about halfway between uh, Goose Bay and uh, uh, tip of Greenland, the uh, sun came up. And I watched the tip of Greenland go by, and being the navigator, I was very happy that it was it was there at the time that I said it was going to be there. <laughs> and we went on past that and uh, on towards Iceland. Well, the weather closed in, and about the time we got to Iceland, it was dusk, and we uh, we were, I think, about uh, 15 miles south. Uh, when we came in, which is not bad navigating, but nothing to use. And we came in <clears throat> and uh, put her down on the ground, went in and had uh, supper, and they tied everything down on the thing because the front caught up with us there. Three days later, the snow quit. And uh, they started thawing our, uh, thawing our aircraft out. They'd bring them in to the hangar and and melt all the snow out. And 12 days after we put down on uh, Keflavik, uh, Iceland, we uh, took off and flew to uh, Valley Wales. Uh, Valley Wales uh, was one of the main, uh, Presswick and Valley, and um, there was one other one. Oh, one, the other one was in um, Northern Ireland. There were the main uh, touchdown places for the uh, crews coming over. And we touched down in, in Valley Wales, and as I said, the personal note that I had said something about before in our conversation, my cousin, uh, one of my cousins that uh, we grew up with, was a member of the 20th Fighter Group uh, in England. And on the 19th of February, when we landed, he had been on a mission and was shot down and spent, was captured and uh, spent the rest of the war in a POW camp. And I didn't find that out until <clears throat> uh, af actually after the war had terminated over there, 
and I had time to go up to his uh, fighter base. Now, and, and where was he shot down? He was shot down uh, near Munich. Well, it, yeah, near Munich. It was in a, it, it was in a, he landed in a field that uh, the farmers had prepared for uh, planting. And so when he went down, he bogged up to his uh, ankles and that. He had a, a, his wingman, contrary to orders, his wingman decided he could save Joe. And he landed on the field. Um, when he got to the end of the field, he applied brakes and tipped up a little bit and the propeller dug into the ground. But the thing rocked back and the propeller uh, had one bent blade. Uh, but when it rocked back, it settled really bad in there. And Joe had come up and had gotten into the cockpit with, and they tried to take off and the airplane wouldn't budge. So they both got out and ran. But that, uh, uh, we, we got out the 19th, we went to uh, a replacement depot, Stone. And here's where I was introduced to uh, English beers and ales. And uh, there were many uh, Americans that thought they could drink beer that got over there and found out that the English had something <laughs> that they had never heard of before. Uh, particularly in the uh, Stone Ale, there was, uh, the Stone area, there was a, an ale, Jules Stone Ale. And you could have uh, one pint, and if you were uh, a neophyte at drinking beer, that pint would knock you to your knees and keep you down. If you were a seasoned veteran, you could take care of two. And we had a, uh, we went in on, on Liberty uh, into a dance area and in the area of Newcastle near there. And um, we were getting on the bus and this, one of the three guys that had gone in with uh, two with me and myself. And we were standing there talking, waiting for the bus to come. And this fellow said, that's what did it. And we said, turned to him and said, what did what? And he had passed out. He was on the, he was on the ground. We had to pick him up and get him on the bus and <laughs> get him back to the base. <laughs> but he had, he had had one too many of those uh, jewel stone ale and it knocked him down. We were there uh, at Stone uh, probably a week and a half. And then we got our assignment to the 92nd. Uh, we came in and uh, we were assigned to the 327th Bomb Squadron. The 92nd was known, as nickname was Fame's Favored Few. And uh, I'm, I'm not so sure we were favored at all, but uh, that, was the na that was the slogan. And we uh, went through a week or so of orientation and classes and uh, practice missions around uh, learning to navigate in, in England. And it is, uh, as an aerial navigator, doing what we call pilotage, which is flying with reference to the, the uh, ground features. Every English town, village, whatever, has a church. They all have spires. They are all built out of stone. And you just can't determine where you are by towns. This is what they taught us as navigators. They said you take the British maps and the British maps have all of the woodlands plotted because there are laws about cutting down trees. You can't cut down trees without permits and as a consequence your wood, wooded areas stay the same. 
and you picked out a few that you recognized that, uh, that you could recognize around your air base and you navigated by wood patches. And it, uh, we had one uh, when we were in Al uh, up in Alconbury for radar, the, the primary runway was an east-west runway. And 10 miles west of the end of the east-west runway, there was a patch of woods that looked like a one-headed arrow just uh, that was lined up right with the runway. So when you were coming in, you were flying pilots, you looked for that, and you were home. So that, uh, lots of little interesting things like that. Well, the, after we finished our training, in uh, Pottington on the 92nd coming in, we uh, came up on my 21st birthday and we were scheduled for our first combat mission as a crew on my 21st birthday. And we took off. And as I said, we when, when that happens to you, you're not sure that the good Lord has intended for you to get much further. And uh, so uh, it was with some, some concern that I took off. We went over uh, the Ruhr Valley, uh, and as any uh, 8th Air Force veteran knows, the Ruhr Valley was a very unfriendly place. And the Germans had uh, about as much anti-aircraft fire in there as you could run into. But we went into the Ruhr Valley, and our, our target was a marshalling yards in the valley at a little town called Raiklinghausen. And that will always be with me. Uh, we got back, and we were debriefed, and the uh, intelligence officer was asking, and we, the pilot said that we, were, we had hit heavy flak. The debriefing officer put out moderate. It, it, um, it looked bad, but it uh, wasn't as bad as it could have been. As we later found out, we went into Berlin, and the nine missions that I flew, uh, Reiklinghausen was the first, and then we flew to uh, bomb a jet, a jet plane base, Achmer, in the uh, area between uh, Holland and Germany. We uh, went up and bombed uh, the river at uh, Bremen, uh, a, a good prime target in Germany, and uh, they always had a warm greeting for you. Yeah. Uh, then we went to a place, uh, Fossburg, which was a, an experimental uh, base where they tested rockets, jet planes, and anything new they had. So we went, went after that. Went to Berlin, uh, bombed a uh, uh, fire, uh, firearms manufacturer. Uh, that, that particular one, we had, uh, we, had bom we had bombed Berlin, and we had come out of Berlin, come, uh, gone a little east, then south, and then come back to the west. And we had, uh, had not experienced anything particularly bad except over the target. And uh, we were tooling along, and we had been over uh, a bank of clouds since we left Berlin. And my armor gunner uh, was up front, and he, he says, Ford, come up here. And I said, look, so I'm finding where I am. Uh, he said, come up here. And I said, I got up. Get my position. You know, we just, I've just come out. He said, well, says, there's a canal up here. He said, I want you to look at it. I said, oh, heck, okay, go ahead, and I'll be there. So I went up, and, and about the time I got up and got my head in the transparency of the nose, we had three rounds of anti-aircraft fire that went off to the left of our plane. And we had, uh, we were... Uh, to the left of the uh, lead 
crew. And then there was a crew, there was an airplane just off of our left. And when those first three uh, rounds exploded, the plane on our left pulled out of formation and started down trailing smoke. We watched all nine of the crew bail out. But we were, we were perfectly content not bothering anybody at that time. And boom, we lost the thing. And that was the, that was the closest that I came to anything like that. And we went down to uh, the Munich area. We went into Leipzig. Leipzig was a big uh, transportation and manufacturing center. And we went to a place called Ingolstadt. And I never did figure out what it was that we were going after an Ingolstadt. We did finally drop our bombs on um, uh, the marshalling yards. And, uh, but I, I, don't, I don't really know uh, what it was that was there that was particularly interesting. But, and we didn't see, um, we saw maybe, well, our crew saw two uh, fighter aircraft at that time. We were in 1945, we were in March and April. The war was almost over. And uh, my crew, after I left, we, I flew nine crew, nine missions with our crew. When they pulled me out and put me into radar school, um, my crew flew an additional four missions before there were no more combat missions flown. So uh, we were at the, at the tail end of the whole fracas. But um, we saw uh, a, fight, a fighter over Holland uh, in the air. It turned and make, made a pass. We had had to uh, abort a run, a bomb run, and come back around, did a 360, came all the way back around and made a second bomb run. We were the last squadron on continent and there was one fighter in the air, and they, he started after us, and we saw him, and the airplanes pulled up so close together that you could have walked from one side to the other without falling. But uh, he decided that there were just too many guns looking at him, and he peeled off and left us. Then the other fighter that I saw was uh, down, we had been down to Ingolstadt, and uh, there was uh, one of the Fock Wolf airplanes that uh, was developed during the latter part of the war that uh, was really a good airplane. And uh, we were up flying back in. Our uh, escort had been, had been cleared to leave and take targets of opportunity and strafe. And well, there were two P-51s down below us and this one German airplane and the two fifty ones kind of lined up on him and started pulling up, and that pilot, German pilot, saw them, and he just put that uh, throttle forward, and that airplane walked off and left our fifty ones just like it was standing still. But it was uh, that was a, a Fock Wolf TA one fifty four, a one no one one fifty two. T-152, which was a, a, der a derivative of the uh, Falk Wolf FW-190, but uh, it, it just walked off and left them. And the Germans at the latter part of the war had some airplanes, had they had a different leader than they did, uh, would have given us a lot of trouble. And they gave us enough trouble as it was. But uh, at the end of uh, my uh, radar, uh, the Germans had surrendered, and uh, we came back and were disbanded, and I was uh, sent back as a radar operator, I was sent back to the States to go on to uh, Japan, possibly. And when he had a 30-day leave, uh, I spent that at home and had uh, got all rested up, went up to Greensboro, North Carolina at the replacement depot up there. While I was up there, the Japs surrendered. Um, I stayed around another week and uh, they sent me down to Boca Raton. They had just finished some new buildings on the air base down there. 
So I went down there and I spent uh, a month and a half sitting in the barracks and going to the old club and waiting for them to decide what they were going to do with us. And uh, then I ended up going uh, at that, from that point, I ended up in November of 45 going up to Drew Field and uh, just north of Tampa and they uh, discharged me there or put me on reserve status and I came home. And that was in 45 and in 47 I met the young lady that had been that had gone to University of Nebraska. And she had come to Atlanta? And she had come down she'd come down here. She finished up uh, she's a very intelligent young lady. I don't know why she married me, but she's a very intelligent young lady. Uh, she had been at, I, I say she was thrown out of three of the best schools in, uh, in the country. She'd gone to, for a freshman year, had gone to a school called McMurray in Illinois, which was a girls' school and one of the best girls' schools in, in the country. Then she went to the University of Nebraska for two years, sophomore and junior year, and she decided she wanted to be in radio. And Nebraska did not have a good radio department, but Northwestern did. So she went up to Northwestern, and she got up there, and she only had one, uh, one year to do, uh, two semesters, to finish our requirements. She got up there, and she finished up those two semesters and found out that Northwestern wouldn't graduate you unless you had three semesters at Northwestern. So she had, she had to go to Northwestern for an extra thing. Uh, she was, uh, for that last semester, she was put into a program, uh, had four, four students, three graduate students, and an undergraduate. She was the undergraduate. Uh, she had, uh, she was to produce a series of uh, uh, children's shows for Saturday in Chicago. She uh, produced and directed among the people that she worked with that were going to Northwestern at the same time was Paul Lind, Cloris Leachman, uh, Charlotte Ray, and a couple of others. Uh, Bob Banner. Bob Banner was the producer of the Dinah Shore program. Mm -hmm. And so she, she's had a, a right nice life too. But after we got married in 48, uh, I got, uh, I was working downtown and going to tech. Uh, my mother, uh, they diagnosed her with a head uh, brain tumor, and uh, about that time we found out that we were expecting we were going to be parents. And uh, in uh, '51, my mother died in February of '51 on Sunday, before our first son was born on Saturday. And uh, so that, we tilled in that. In January of 40, uh, 51, I uh, approached Lockheed. Lockheed was opening up, and they hired me. And were you going to, to school at the same time? I was going to school at the same time, time and, and I had kind of, I dropped out for, for a quarter. I thought it was going to be a quarter. I dropped out and um, went to work for Lockheed, and. Uh, uh, I had worked for Lockheed for three months, and, the and uh, since I was a re um, reserve second lieutenant, they came and got me. And I went down to Montgomery and was put in B-29s as a radar operator. And uh, we uh, uh, went from there to say, 18, 17, 18 months of service in Korean affair. 
uh, my crew and B-29s, we, we came out to be, uh, we were trained down in um, Randolph Field in San Antonio, Texas. And uh, we were sent to um, Stoneman, I think, in uh, California, which is the uh, uh, port of departure for Korea. And when I hit there, there was a Red Cross waiting for me. My father had gone into the hospital and uh, uh, was having a kidney operation, and they wanted me home. So I came back, and he went under the knife, and uh, he had had kidney stones all of his life. Probably had been operated on about a half dozen times, and this time it didn't work. And, uh, I ended up staying in the service, but uh, stone went down to uh, uh, Savannah, Hunter Field, and I rode out the rest of my service at Hunter Field. And uh, then I got out, went back to work for Lockheed, and I told my wife at the time, this is the second time I've been out, in and out of the uh, Air Force, air, aircraft industry. I said, if they had drafted me again, if they came and got me again, I said, I wasn't going to get anywhere near an airplane again. Well, we had uh, a pretty good run, 31 years with Lockheed. And I've been uh, retired from Lockheed come April, 21 years. So that's 52 years of life. Now, um, were any of your other family members, I mean, you mentioned your cousin, were, were they, and at the same time, any of your brothers, or? Uh, my, my two cousins, uh, I had two, I had uh, the, the girl cousin, my girl cousin was, she was the oldest one of the group. She married a lieutenant in the Marine Corps, and he was, uh, Fielding Chapman, who was the Commandant of the Marine Corps, as I said, during the Nixon and um, I know the Nixon administration, but I'm not sure which others. But um, she uh, she went everywhere he did in the, in the, that she could go in the Pacific. Her younger brother, Charles, was a uh, fighter pilot in the. 207th fighter group, I think. I think it's 207. But he was uh, he was on a P-38 outfit in the 9th Air Force, and he was killed uh, Christmas Eve, 1944, uh, on a mission over Belgium. They got a, a, a lucky hit right smack in his his uh, gas tanks, and there wasn't anything left. But his his brother Joe was in the 20th fighter group, and uh, he, uh, as I said, was shot down on the same day that I arrived in, in uh, England. My brother, just younger, uh, Ewing, uh, two years younger than I am, uh, he was in the Marine Corps and was involved in the Ewo landing. And uh, he, he now lives in uh, Hawaii, and uh, then my next brother, Flicky, who died this past summer, he uh, went in in 51, he went into the Korean affair and was stationed in Japan uh, during the Korean police action. And he was a cartoonist for uh, Stars and Stripes over there. And he spent the rest, after he got out of the service, he got a job uh, with Smith Publishing down here, and then got itchy feet, got married, got itchy feet, and decided to see what he could do in New York, and ended up with Time Life Corporation as development director 
for the time Life Corporation, Life Corporation. Um, and he passed away this summer. My uh, baby brother, who died uh, two weeks after 911, was also in the Korean affair. He was in the Marine Corps. We have two Marines. My brother Enfield was um, the one that worked for Time Life. He was uh, in the infantry, and I was in the Air Force. And then uh, I got cousins, numerous cousins that were in the Navy and the Air Force and everything else. Yeah, what back home and with so many, like you said, with cousins and everything, what was, what was the communication like? Did you have much communication at all uh, once you were overseas? Um, overseas, overseas, yeah. stri almost strictly uh, between um, my mother my mother and my grandfather, her father, uh, and um, those were, were my connections. Um, I found out uh, I found out where my my cousin was at, uh, uh, at a base called King's Cliff that was uh, about 40, 50 miles north of the base that I was assigned to, and uh, I went up there. Uh, I did. I had not, did not have any knowledge of his being shot down. Uh, but I went up there uh, on one weekend and uh, was greeted by the squadron commander and, and the adjutant and the whole thing, uh, like a long lost cousin because uh, they liked Joe. Joe was uh, Joe was uh, given or earned. A uh, distinguished flying cross on his first combat mission, and uh, this was—he uh, always downplayed it a little bit. Like this was, this was a publicity stunt that uh, the Air Force had engineered so that they could get uh, uh, some some good publicity. And uh, but he was—he uh, was quite a quite a guy. He. Uh, we all of us grew up uh, in around Georgia and uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and we were somewhat country boys, but we lived kind of lived in town too. And uh, so it, uh, we got a well-rounded education. I can build a slingshot. <laughs> I can't hit much with it, but I can build a slingshot. Uh, we did all the things. Uh, we used to go snake hunting. And uh, we had <laughs> we had several things. My mother, my mother, um, four boys, and a husband. So she was the only female on on campus. Mm -hmm. And uh, she uh, she she was very active with her her friends, and they had bridge clubs every every weekend and as boys we would go out and we would hunt animals and snakes and things. Uh, one summer we caught a mole in the front yard. We found we found the little hump running along the lawn so I went and got a, a spading fork and two of us got out there and <coughs> took the spading fork and figured out where that mole was going to be, and then pushed the fork in the ground. And when he hit there, we flipped him out. We caught him. And my father had a, a, a an aquarium that was not used, <coughs> so we put dirt in the aquarium. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. <coughs> he, uh, we put the mole in the aquarium with the fill with dirt, and he stayed there for a while. We we would put worms in there for him to eat and so forth. And, and uh, like other kids, got wild pets. You know, we go off and lose, we left him. Didn't pay much attention to him. Well, we had a hot air furnace system. 
And with four boys in the family, these registers that went down to the floor always had a, a rib or two missing. And my mother had a bridge party started, and this was before the days of air conditioning. And it was a hot Saturday afternoon. She decided that just a half hour before the party started, she's going to turn on she's going to turn on the basement fan, pull the cool air out of the basement, and cool off the front. Well, you you have never smelled anything quite so bad. She called my father. He came in from the garden. <laughs> he went down the basement, and there in the plenum of the furnace, where the furnace pulled all of the nice cool air out of the basement, was the mole. Obviously dead and very ripe. And that air had been circulated through the whole house. We had to go. We had to go around our neighbors, and our neighbors weren't very close at that time. Uh, and borrow electric fans, turn off the furnace, borrow electric fans, and have them blown through the store to get rid of that dead skunk smell. Now, you had mentioned in an earlier conversation um, about that you went back to England. One. Yeah, and I'd like to to get you to touch upon the people you stayed in touch with. Like you mentioned, you were looking for somebody. Have you had reunions? Stayed in touch with people? And you, know, you got and and many about going back. We do have we do have. Uh, I've been to uh, two two eighth Air Force reunions, and I've been to half a dozen bomb group reunions. Uh, the uh, there was the people in England that I uh, were looking up and looking for were actually uh, I couldn't I never did find anybody that I really was had been familiar with, but I did uh, make some good friends on the um, what did they call that organization FOTE F O T E Friends of the Eighth. And that's, those are our English citizens that uh, supported um, information centers on the various uh, bomb groups. And they, every one of those bomb stations over there has a little group of locals that support the history of that, era, that group. And uh, I've got uh, a couple, John and Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth um, Hadfield. John is, um, he was uh, a member of uh, the 92nd support group. And then he got pulled off because he lived near, uh, and I don't remember what the station, uh, the station's name was, but it was the facility where the uh, British decoding people worked. And uh, they, when was that, that connection? Um, had some friends, the Hewlings, that used to live here in Atlanta. Tom Hewling was a member of the 92nd Bomb Group when the Bomb Group first formed. Uh, I found out that uh, I needed to find some information on the 92nd, and I found out Tom's name, and I got in touch with him and found out that he was a member of that, and I was a member of the 92nd as it was leaving England. So we had both ends bracketed. But uh, Tom's wife, Kitty, they both recent, uh, died in the last couple of years. Tom's wife, Kitty, was the commandant of the WAC squadron in the 8th Air Force uh, headquarters and worked with Jimmy Doolittle. And 
Tom worked. Uh, Tom was in, did his tour with the 92nd, went from there. He didn't want to come home. He went from there to 8th Air Force headquarters. And then uh, at the latter part of the war, he went into the 306 bomb group as a squadron commander. And he finished out the war there. Um, but they had, um, I'm, I'm trying to pull up. The, the John Hadfield, John Hadfield's sister was a friend of Kitty Hewling's. And John Hadfield's sister was in not the Land Army, but the uh, British equivalent of the WAF. And uh, they, uh, she knew Kitty during the war. And John and Elizabeth, his wife Elizabeth, came over on one of the reunions that we had. Uh, well, it was the reunion when the um, uh, Mighty Eighth uh, Heritage Museum was uh, opened in Savannah. And we did our, the modeling club that I belonged to did a diorama down there, a fairly large one. It was 14 feet wide and 22 feet long, and it shows an operating air base, which is a very interesting. If you haven't seen it, you ought to go. But they also had a, we also did a, a diorama for uh, uh, the B-24s and the 8th Air Force that actually took part in the uh, Ploesti raid. We did a diorama down there of that, too. So that's another thing to go see. And are you still um, in touch with some of the people that aren't around here? You stay you know, through email? Oh, yeah, yeah, or yeah. I, I, I have uh, Hadfield's uh, uh, email address, and mm -hmm. I correspond with him every now and then. The uh, uh, gal that we met on our first trip back, the one that took us down the runway. I have her air, uh, email address and I correspond with her. Uh, the, uh, the head of the friends group for our group, uh, our bomb group, uh, John Mills and his wife Di. John passed away uh, about two years ago. But uh, we we uh, enjoyed their company very much. So we had uh, we've had quite. We've been back. Uh, well, I went back and, and on a reunion in, it occurred in England. And then Marilyn and I have been back to three group re uh, reunions here, and two eight, uh, eighth Air Force reunions in this country. So we and we've got uh, active. Friends and and uh, all, but we're getting fewer and fewer of them because we had we lost um, we lost a, um, a lady whose husband was uh, a, a weather observer up in uh, Greenland for a long time during the war. Uh, he passed away three years ago, and she passed away about two weeks ago. Uh, then the Hewlings, both of them are gone now. And it, uh, we, every now and then one, one of our friends turns up missing. Well, now when you went, because we, uh, we weren't taping at the time, you were telling about when you went to England, I guess it was the first time you went back. Was that part of a reunion or just where you were No, that was, that was uh, Mar just Marilyn and I went right. back to England. We. Uh, our first trip back, we uh, uh, we didn't get up to the the bomb area. We did get uh, we did get out to the RAF uh, museum, but uh, we went back just to kind of establish a foothold and see if we wanted to come back later. Well, we went and spent a week. We went over. Uh, we left the day after Christmas. Worst time in the world to go to England, but we had six days over there that we were there. The first three days 
were misty. Not enough to throw your umbrella up, but misty and cloudy. The last three days were like it was in the middle of June. 50, uh, between 55 and 65 degrees. Puffy white clouds, blue sky, beautiful. And you walk through London and look down in the window wells and uh, there are flowers growing down the window well. And it made me so daggum mad because I've been trying to grow geraniums. Mm -hmm. And I can't grow geraniums, I kill them. And my best, my best thing to the geranium uh, hood is to leave them in the nursery and don't take them home and kill them. But these people in the middle of winter got geraniums growing in the window wells. And uh, it's, uh, that's when we made friends with the uh, young lady that took us out. Uh, that was in 1980, uh, 80, 1980 Christmas. We left and went and spent New Year's and came back right after New Year's. Uh, we liked it so much that we signed up for a tour of England in uh, 81. And, and latter part of uh, the summer and we went back over there, and that's when I went up the, the um, uh, runway and it, uh, it really does get you and it still gets me a little bit talking about it because uh, it uh, you remember and if you did you ever see uh, 12 o'clock high look at it uh, Dean Jagger plays the um, returning um, executive officer and he comes up to the fence uh, outlining the airfield on a bicycle and he leans his bicycle up against the fence and he looks out over where the field was and it fades to when you can hear the uh, the engines turning and you do I mean you really do hear it and, and in your case so much of it what was still intact. They yeah. hadn't, runways were still there. Runways were still there and the taxi strips were still there. Most, uh, not most of the buildings, but most of the key buildings mm -hmm. that we uh, that we used were still there. Uh, one of the first things we went when I, we stopped at the control tower and the young man told us that we could go. I asked him about a couple of the buildings that we used. And uh, we went down to our um, uh, building that where our flight line uh, offices were. And this is where we went to pick up our equipment before we went to uh, the airplane. And it's, uh, um, it was still there. and. Uh, there was a, a mural um, that had been in one uh, one of those flight rooms that has been taken apart. It was a brick wall and had been taken apart and been reconstructed and I'm not quite sure where. It's been reconstructed I think over at Duxford where a lot of the, the stuff is. And it's uh, um, it's just it's it's an experience, and it's uh, it's something that not not many many of us left yeah. that that experiencing this. How, how did um, I don't know? How did you feel, or did you read when when Tom Brokaw with, came out with the Greatest Generation? Yeah. Did you read it? Yes. And did that have an effect on you? I've heard from several uh, people that. It made them more comfortable talking about it, I guess, again. That, that yes, okay. yes, uh, it does. And Brokaw, Brokaw sometimes, uh, to people of my age group, Brokaw sometimes comes out to be a flaming liberal and, <laughs> and, not, and not too popular, but he, Brokaw probably is one of the most even-handed uh, newscasters we have and I did I did appreciate and what uh, there's one of those guys doctor uh, 
a doctor that's up here in North Georgia, or was up here in North Georgia, that uh, he writes up writes about in that book. And some somehow I don't remember remember his name now, but somehow we had some connection there. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, he uh, his book um, did kind of did kind of release the hesitancy that some of us had. Uh, some of them, some people had too much of an involvement, and they don't, uh, they still don't like to talk about it. And I, uh, it's this uh, fellow, I, I will see if he has talked to you or not, and if not, I will have him call you. Okay. His name is Albert McMahon. What's the last name again? McMahan. M C M A H A N. Okay. McMahan. Uh, Albert is a. <laughs> it's funny how you run into people. Albert was in the 306 bomb group when the 306 bomb group went over. Tom Hewlings was in the 92nd when the 92nd went over, and they went over fairly close together. Um, Albert finished his missions and went home in 1940, either late 42 or early 43, about the same time that uh, Memphis Bell crew came home. So he did not know Tom Hewlings at all. Tom, uh, because Tom was over in the 92nd, Albert was in 306. When Tom came back, he came back into active service after his hiatus. He came back in the 306, which was the same place that Albert started. But he came back in the 306 about the time I was in the 92nd. Well, when he got down here to Atlanta, Albert came down here because his sister teaches school here. And Albert's wife died. Albert was teaching school up in Alaska. When he retired from Alaska, he came down here to live with his sister because his sister had been widowed. And he started getting together with uh, Silver Wings and the 8th Air Force Association. He met Tom, and they found out that they had been in the same group. And uh, then I, I later, much later, I came along and joined, and here I find, and Albert's an old yeah. Alabama boy. I was, I started my life in Nashville, but I was raised the first five years in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And then I've been here since uh, I was five years old. Since then, and still, still on Buckhead? Yeah, um, Stovall Boulevard, Buckhead. We, we stayed for six months in uh, Decatur. And then our house was our house on Stovall Boulevard, still there. It was the first house that was ever whitewashed in the city of Atlanta. My mother, my mother just drove the contract contractor crazy because they couldn't find anybody that knew anything about whitewashing. <laughs> so it's. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm gonna. We've got just a couple minutes left on the tape, and before I forget, I want to get you to show us the jacket mm -hmm. here that, that you've got and some of the explain um, the well, patches and... Okay. Now what can you... Yeah, you can see here. Yeah. Uh, this is the 327th. Squadron. Now, V.T. Hamlin, who wrote, wrote uh, Alley Oop, the, the comic strip, did this for us because our group uh, formed down in Sarasota. Now, this is the 327th, 92nd Bomb Group. These are navigators' wings. And that, uh, you don't find those anymore. This 8th Air Force patch. This is a radar patch. This is a actually a British insignia that the Air Force, the Eighth Air Force, adopted for its Mickey operators. We had the APS-15, which was a 
the bombing uh, radar that we had, and we had to work with the bombardier and the radar operator. The radar operator could see through the clouds, and he told the bombardier when to set, how to set his bomb sight as we went through. On this, this is the 92nd shoulder patch. And this one I'm most proud of is my daughter, our daughter, did the uh, uh, cross stitching to do that uh, B-17 tail. Uh, that is the tail of the airplane that I flew my last combat mission in. And it was a natural metal. The first one that I flew was a, a, an olive drab and gray. And this was in the 40th Combat Wing, the 1st Air Division. And the little thing down at the bottom, Fame's Favored Few. We had a naughty, we had a naughty bunch of words to go with that, but not, I won't say those. <laughs> okay, well, I think that's going to just about wrap it up here. I'm going to cut this. Go ahead and conclude.